right, in chapter three, we're learning about the types of bonds and naming compounds. So we're going to cover the different types of bonds. We have ionic bonds and covalent bonds are the main ones. Ionics have positive and negative charges. They are associated with charges. Covalent bonds do not have positive and negative charges, but they could have partial charges. But the bond itself is created by when two atoms share their valence electron. So here are gifts of both of them. So you have the electrostatic interaction you see from the sodium, it loses an electron, brings it to the chlorine, chlorine then gains a negative charge, sodium gains a positive charge. So ionic charges, here's the trend. So group 1A is plus one, 2A is plus two. Um, these transition metal groups, there are a few exceptions to the transition elements. Most of them can have multiple charges, but silver is always plus one. Cadmium and zinc are always plus two. And when you go to group 3A, aluminum and gallium only are plus three. The other ones can vary. So when you go from the noble gases to the left, the noble gases have zero charge because they don't like to react with anything. The halogens have a negative one charge since they need one electron to get their octet, which is eight electrons total in their outer ring. The oxygen group 6A requires two electrons to reach their eight, which means when they gain those two, they have a minus two charge. And nitrogen and phosphorus have a minus three charge. And car carbon can also have a negative four charge on occasion. When we're naming compounds, we're going to go through the ionic naming parameters and scheme. So basically, you name the first metal and then you name the nonmetal. So ionics are going to be between metals and nonmetals. So you name the metal, then you name the nonmetal, but with the IDE ending. So CA, calcium, and sulfur would be calcium sulfide. Potassium and fluorine would be potassium fluoride. Magnesium and oxygen would be magnesium oxide. You never use prefixes for these. So for Na2S, it would be not disodium, it would be sodium sulfide. So for ionic bonds, you never use prefixes, very important rule. When you have ionic bonds that have a transition metal, you are going to put a Roman numeral denoting the transition metal's charge after the metal's name. So iron, there could be two types of iron chloride, iron with a plus three charge and iron with a plus two charge. So for the iron with a plus three charge, it would simply be iron three chloride. For the plus two charge, iron two chloride. And again, the IDE ending comes after the name. And then you can go backwards from the formula to the name. So Mg and O2 or magnesium and oxide. So it would be magnesium. You have Mg two plus and oxygen. Oxide is oxygen. So it's O minus two. So it would be a simple one to one ratio because the charges of the cation need to cancel out with the charges of the anion. So it would be magnesium oxide would be MgO. Some more examples we will do during class. The polyatomic ions. So the polyatomic ions are a group of ions that you have to know their names and their charges in the formulas. And they are common in basically a group of atoms that have one charge. By most of them have an oxygen in them. Some of them do not, like ammonium. But most of them have oxygen in them. So we will go over those more specifically during class. When you name with the polyatomic ions, it's very simple. All you do is use the name of the polyatomic ion that comes after the name of the metal. So it would be um, Al aluminum, well, sorry, um, AlSO4 or Al2SO43 would be aluminum sulfate. Since SO4 is sulfate, Al is aluminum, and you need to balance out the charges by doing um, your least common denominator or least common multiple of the charges. More examples. So acids, you can name acids um, acids have an H in the beginning of their name or in the beginning of their formula, and they dissolve in water. And when you name acids, first thing you need to ask is, does the anion contain oxygen? If it doesn't, like C HCl and HBr, you will then use the hydro prefix and then the chloric, the ic ending, and then acid. So for HCl, it would be hydrochloric acid. For HBr, hydrobromic acid. For HI, hydroiodic acid. For Anions that do have an oxygen in them, you use either the IT ending or the ITE or the IT or the ATE ending based on their, um, or if they have that ending, you use the, you change that to OUS or IC. So sulfurous versus sulfuric. Sulfurous is H2SO3, sulfuric is H2SO4 because sulfite is ITE and sulfate is, is ATE. Here are some examples. So here's a good slide showing all the rules of naming, ionics and covalence. The empirical formula 
shows the simplest whole, whole number ratio of atoms in a compound. Um, it can then be multiplied to have the structural formula or the molecular formula and then the structural formula depending on um, which compound we're talking about. Uh, the empirical formula can be found and here are the steps to finding it. So you convert the grams, you convert the percentages to grams and assume you have a 100 gram sample. You then convert those grams of each element into moles and then you divide by the number of the smallest moles and then you multiply the mole ratios by a whole number to make all of the mole ratios whole. So for example, here's the kind of problems you would get. You have 100 grams of substance containing uh, carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen. In this case, you don't need percentages, you have grams already. But basically what we're gonna do is to find the moles of carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen. We're going to divide each of these grams by the molecular weight for those elements. For carbon, the molecular weight is 12, so we're gonna divide 38.67 by 12, and we're gonna get 3.33. For hydrogen, we're going to divide that by the molecular mass of hydrogen, which is 1.008, and for nitrogen, by 14.01. We then end up with ratios of moles. We're going to divide these by the least amount of moles, so it would be 3.2. So we're dividing all three of these numbers by 3.2, so we end up with 1, 5, and 1. So our ratio of carbon to hydrogen to nitrogen is five is 1 to 5 to 1. So it would be C, H5, N would be our um, empirical formula. So here's another example. Basically, what we're doing is the same thing, but we have percentages. So we're taking our 60%, turning it into 60 grams, dividing by 12 to figure out your moles for carbon, our 4.47 grams of hydrogen, dividing it by 1.008. So we find out my moles for hydrogen. And same thing, 35.53 grams divided by 16 grams per mole of oxygen. And then you take those molar numbers, divide them by their least amount, and you end up with 2.25 for carbon, two for hydrogen, and one for oxygen. But you can't have 2.25 of an atom. So we have to multiply this by four, every number in that ratio by four, in order to maintain whole numbers. So you would end up with nine carbons, eight hydrogens, and four oxygens. We are then talking about combustion. So combustion is the burning of any organic compound that contains C's, H's, and O's, and even some nitrogens that is reactive with oxygen to every single time create the product CO2 and H2O. We can then use the skills that we learned to solve problems that involve combustion if we don't know um, the empirical and molecular formula for a combustion reactant. So if we have the amount of carbon, we can then divide and figure out the, the moles of carbon and then the moles of hydrogen. And then by deducing with that, we can find out the moles of oxygen, but we'll do this one during class. So determining the molar mass of a compound, you add up the molar masses for all of the elements involved in the compound. And then percent composition, if we have a sample of 100 grams of, let's say, in this case, we have um, oxygen in water. So we have out of water's, uh, water's atomic mass is 18, the mass of oxygen, in water is 16, so 16 divided by 18 is about 88% oxygen. And we could use this mass percent as a conversion factor. So I'll calculate the mass percent of oxygen in NaClO4. So you would do four times 16, that would be the amount of oxygen, divided by the molar mass of the entire compound, which would be 23 plus 35.45 plus 64, and that would end up with a percent, 52.3%. And then there's more problems. And then that is it. So if you have any questions, I know this is a very fast tutorial, but we will cover the whole lecture during class. And you can comment questions if you have them below. Thank you.